And our first guest is Marita Golden. And she has a new book. And it's a topic that we mentioned several times on the show. Rhonda had her dissertation related around this topic. So her book is called The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. So welcome to Black Authors Matter TV. I am so glad to be here. We're so glad to have you. And your book just recently came out. So um, tell us now, oh, the rest of your books, most of them have been fiction. I believe, is that correct? Am I correct? Well, actually they've been a mix of fiction and nonfiction. This is my 19th book. Okay. And so I sort of go back and forth between fiction and nonfiction. I've edited some anthologies and um, as a cultural activist started the Hurston Wright Foundation. So I've been busy. Okay. Yes, the Hurston Wright Foundation is amazing. And I am so glad I'm back in the area because I've been wanting to, I've been wanting to participate with the, um, with the, um, the workshops that you do um, throughout the year. Um, the, are you still doing the, um, the one workshop that you do each year? Well, they're now virtual you know, okay. because, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but we do the weekend workshop and we do the summer writers workshop awesome. as well as, yeah, as well as public readings and the legacy awards. Okay, well, you'll be well, saying for those who, don't, who aren't familiar, tell us about the Hurston Wright Foundation. Well, the Hurston Wright Foundation was founded 31 years ago. I started it with $750 of my own money. And um, it is a institution actually that is committed to providing community recognition, training and honoring black writers. So that for the last 30 years, we have been providing awards for black college fiction writers we now get support from uh, the Undefeated, the um, national online sports journal for a nonfiction award. We also give the Legacy Award for the best published author of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. And each year we honor, uh, this year we honor Chimamanda Adichie, for example, for her work. And then our summer writers workshops have produced writers like Tayari Jones and Britt Bennett, and they're writers that we recognize early in their career when they were in college. So we have been responsible for really recognizing and nurturing a generation or more of black writers. So I'm assuming that it's named after Zora Hurston. <laughs> you would be right. And Richard Wright. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So yes. how so can people get involved in the workshops? How do they sign up for them? Well, you can simply visit hurstonwright.org okay. and there you will find information about how to get involved, um, submission dates for um, all the contests we have, as well as information about um, upcoming programs. I'm no longer involved in the administrative end of the uh, foundation. We have a great new team, but I am President Emerita. Okay, now well I'm, I'm just making a note so I can remember to look that up when we get off the show tonight. So um, tell us about your new book. Well, The Strong Black Woman is a book that like so many of my books, I really hadn't planned to write. Sometimes a book will just call you, claim you. Yeah, I do. You'll, you'll, in, in your dreams, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was I, had been having a little health issue. And I felt like I was having a stroke, but I really wasn't. So anyway, long story short, I went to the emergency room, checked out fine, went to my primary doctor who gave me an MRI. And I found out that I'd had sometime in the past two silent strokes. Mm. Now, silent strokes are pretty normal. Um, you can have them not know what's happening, but it's still a stroke. Many, many people have them. The problem was that my mother died of a stroke and my father died of a heart attack. And I had considered myself the poster child for good health. When I lost my mother at 21 and my father at 23, I started exercising, um, eating healthy, meditating, doing all the things that would ensure my health 
and I go to the therapist when I need to. So when I found out that I'd had these two silent strokes, I got to thinking about Black women's health in general. And we were in the midst of the pandemic and the lockdown. And I found that there was a really vibrant, vital conversation going on about Black women's mental health, Black women's health, and people were challenging the strong Black woman complex. So I decided that I wanted to kind of enroll in that army of writers and scholars and thinkers and add my, um, my thoughts to the conversation. Well, you had some, uh, in your synopsis, you had some things that were just, um, you used three words, invincible, reliable, resilient. And you also said that these things sort of lead to, or the end result of it is you ignore self-care, you put yourself last, and you shoulder burdens, even those not your own. Yeah, and I want to talk for a minute about where the strong black woman ideology, cultural, yeah, cultural sensibility come from. And of course, we know it comes from slavery because in yeah. slavery, mm -hmm. we yeah. were considered chattel. We were considered not human. And so as such, we were designated. Our men were designated. We were designated. Our children were designated. Strong. So mm -hmm. what we did was we did what many oppressed groups do. We took the negative language that people want to um, demonize us with and we turned it into a positive. So if, we go, if you say we're strong, okay, we will be strong. You can throw right. anything at me and we will be resilient, we'll come back. Now it's an adaptation that served us, but now we're beginning to recognize that it doesn't any longer serve us to just be strong all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mentioned this last week, and I think that we try so hard to be strong that often we don't even want to admit to ourselves that we might be hurting. Because if we admit to ourselves, then we're admitting a weakness and we don't want to, we don't want to appear weak. So we just want to pretend that we're unfazed and we don't care and it doesn't bother us. And I think what it winds up doing is just as you said, it kind of tears us up on the inside and it actually causes more stress to where you'll see panic attacks and so forth because we don't, we don't, we don't feel safe to have an outlet anymore. And the, one of the exciting things that's happening is that this conversation of smashing the strong black woman ideology is multi-generational. So if you go on social media, you will see young black women, middle-aged black women, older black women saying, look, enough is enough. Because what happens is too many of us are on emotional lockdown. It's one thing to say, I'm a strong black woman, but I also want people to look at me and say, okay, boy, you look really good for your age. Clearly black don't crack. But you know what I would also say to them? I'd say, well, you know, what you see is that black did crack, but I repaired it. Amen. And I'm not afraid or ashamed to say that what you're seeing is strength, but also vulnerability. So we're on emotional lockdown, really separated from our deepest, deepest feelings. And we pay a heavy mental and physical price. Absolutely, I, absolutely. I agree. Um, a lot of times we have so many people depending on us. That's, you know, that's, um, and, and that can happen it's not something we plan necessarily. It's just circumstances end up being that way. For one, we right. live longer than you know than our male counterparts. We tend to be healthier than our male counterparts, mm -hmm. and so um, and and then and then sometimes with children or with grandchildren. Um, I don't have any grandchildren yet, but. I know there are many grandparents that have had to take their grandchildren yeah, in up. and raise right. another generation. Um, and see, as, as Black women, because we suffer perennially with systemic racism, it's meant that we don't have access to good jobs, good housing, all that. And our men who would, in a better situation, be our partners often find themselves unable to be partners with us as we raise our families. They're, they're disproportionately incarcerated. 
they're disproportionately denied good jobs. So we end up shouldering all those burdens that you just talked about. And it's a funny thing because on the one hand, you feel very powerful to have to shoulder those burdens and to respond and meet everyone's needs. But at the same time, it's weakening you. And the fact that you never feel that you can say no right. corrupts your relationships with other people. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I got over that a long time ago. That's not- so did I. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm good at it. Um, I didn't get over it a long time ago, but I'm. this is something that I've been actually working on the past few years because yeah. what I found is when you do try to be strong and you try to be everything to everybody, you wind up being nothing to anybody because you're not giving your full, your full um, effort to anything because you stretched yourself so thin. So that was something that I had to come to grips with so that I can finally learn how to let some things drop, um, learn, learn to know what I needed to hold on to, and then tell some, um, tell some people, no, I'm sorry, it sounds like a great opportunity, but I can't do this right now. Okay. And that way you're not disappointing people. And at the same time, you're staying true to yourself. But also you're empowering other people to solve their own problems. Mm-hmm. Right. And sometimes you need to disappoint people. I mean, they may be because their assumption that you're going to take on <laughs> whatever their, you know, their project. I, you know, I, I used to have people. I don't even, I don't even entertain it anymore. But you know, people would come to me with ideas they had, and like sit them in my lap. Like I, I have this, and I'm like, okay, great, you go run with it, because I'm, you know, I. But but they will do that. And uh, when I was about your age, Rhonda, I, that was when I, <laughs> and I, you know, it, it takes, it takes a while because you really, yeah, it's, it's a process. Really helpful. Right. You really do want to be helpful to people, but then mm-hmm. you realize that people take advantage of, of that sometimes. So I'll tell help. you what I was, when I was a teenager in ROTC, we had a saying, if it is to be, it's up to me. And I took that way too much to heart because every time I felt like something needed to be done and I was getting mad because like nobody else is doing this, but it needs to get done. The next thing you know, I have a million projects I'm juggling. So (laughs) it was something that I, like I said, I really had to learn. Okay, you know, I don't have to do everything. Sometimes you have to let other people have the opportunity to excel. And Black women are tasked not only with helping our families, but we have to save democracy. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> you know, please, please. Yeah, we 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 take on a lot, but but we we do it well. And I I said about three years ago, before COVID, I was talking to some people and I said, you know what? I just felt like this is our time. This is a time for Black women to shine when we hadn't had our moment before. And I felt mm-hmm. like the time was coming, like it was imminent. And it has um, some, it has manifested, not in full, but there's just so many things that are happening um, with Black women doing so many different things in different arenas. And um, well, one of the most important things we're doing is talking about this because the fact is that Black women are actually in a health emergency. The statistics around our health are really quite sobering. Four out of five black women are overweight or or obese. We have skyrocketing rates of diabetes. The fastest growing segment of the population developing dementia and Alzheimer's is black women. We have very high rates of cardiac heart problems. And we've got to start talking about that. We've got to start talking about our health and the price we pay for not saying no and meaning it and too rarely saying yes to ourselves. And I think that those of us like, you know, who are on this conversation, who are actively engaged in mental and physical health practices, we have to start taking responsibility for our sisters who are not and start talking to them about the things we're doing in a way that doesn't shame them, but that invites them to protect their health. I agree with you and and, um, I do that when when the opportunity arises, you know, it, a lot of times it's conversational, but there's, there are many things that 
small things that we can do that are not costly, but just, um, you know, just to help our immune systems. And diet has a lot to do with it. We need to all eat more fresh, eat more green, eat more fresh vegetables and fruits and less starch um, because, you know, if you don't have some green in your diet every day, you are going to develop problems. It's just the human being was not designed not to eat green. And people who don't tend to pick up a lot of weight. And it's hard to get weight off once, once you get it on. It's difficult. So how's the reception been to your book? Well, the reception has been very, very enthusiastic. And I think at this point, if I could, I wanted to read a little passage you, you did mention from the that. book. Yeah. yeah, one of the things that, see, this is a book that is written by a storyteller. And it's kind of written in the same way that I wrote my other books, Saving Our Sons, Raising Black Children in a Turbulent World, and Don't Play in the Sun, One Woman's Journey Through a Color Complex, in that it's a communal memoir. I start out telling my story. I interview therapists, doctors, um, psychiatrists. I interview Black women about their process of going through trauma, healing. I even write about literature and Zora Neale Hurston and how her story, um, Their Eyes Are Watching God is so healing. But I really was so profoundly moved by the fact that so many Black women were very generous in telling me stories about how they had gone into therapy, how they had learned how to say yes to themselves. So the book has those kinds of stories in it too. So I wanna read a little passage from one of those women. And this is a young woman who um, grew up in a family that struggled with, um, her father struggled with alcoholism. Her mother had kidney failure and um, she became the anchor, you know, that, that, that child that everybody depends on. And she was very honest about her journey to being able to say yes to herself and to tell her parents that she could not take on so much of the burden that they had put on her. Um, she says, because by then I was deeply into the superwoman, the strong black woman syndrome. All of this was my burden to carry. But in 19, Jamie took the first of many steps to lay her burden down by going to counseling for adult children of alcoholics. Quote, prayer led me to counseling. All my life, I had been told not to share our business, but prayer helped me realize it was okay to seek professional counseling outside the church. She had found faith to endure and overcome in church, but in group counseling, she could hear and see through the din and the fog of her life at home. She began to put the pieces together like a puzzle. Her father told her, stand up for yourself. Don't let white people keep you down. But that warning was followed by the accusation that she talked too much and had a smart mouth. Her mm -hmm. mother said, be proud of, be a proud black woman, be strong, I love you, but don't tell anybody our business. Tell me what you feel, but I need you. You can handle this. You are the first one I call, the one I can always depend on. Jamie was crumbling beneath the burden, but in group therapy, that was one place where she could be herself, something she was still discovering. I told, um, and she finally had the first, on, first honest conversation with her parents. I told them, I can't carry you. I can't carry my anger. I can't carry my hurt. She set boundaries and put herself first. I wasn't protected as a child, but now I was ready to protect myself. I told them, I love you, mom. I love you, dad, but I release you. I choose me. Mm. That is powerful. And that tells the story of so many women and what they go through, feeling like they have to hold the world on their shoulders and still manage themselves and still have a relationship and still have friends and still have a social life. You know, it's a lot that women juggle. And a lot of times I think that we don't realize how much we juggle until we just sit down and start writing all of this down. Or, or until we crumble, until yeah. we're in the emergency room. And the thing about therapy is a couple of things. If the first therapist you go to doesn't, is not a match, that's okay. 
you're looking for a therapist the way you're looking for a good job. So you get to shop for the right therapist. Also, you don't have to wait until you're in total meltdown to seek mental health counseling. Right. You can seek mental health counseling as you're beginning to feel a little discomfort. And um, in my research, I found a really good resource for Black women. Uh, Dr. Joy Harden Braden has a website called Therapy for Black Girls. And it's a wonderful website where if you are looking for a Black therapist anywhere in the country, she has the list so you can find a culturally sensitive therapist. She also has a podcast. She also has a newsletter and lots of information that detoxify the conversation about Black women seeking mental health care. Hmm. Wow. How is your that, book, how is your book organized? Like how do you how is it structured? Well, it's structured, as I said, um, a series of um it's a it's a mix of journalism, it's a it's a bit of personal memoir, um, it's interviews with, you know, um, for example, I have a whole section on grief and grieving, and the fact that very often black women are not allowed to grieve. For example, when we think of the mothers of many of the high profile people, you know, like Trayvon Martin and many of those people who were, who were murdered by police, we kind of want black women to grieve um, respectively, um, to, to hold their grief so that it's, um, it's kind of in check. And there's a whole section where I write about the, the fact that in our community, we're always grieving. We're not just grieving murders, we're grieving the daily assaults to our dignity mm -hmm. and our humanity. And um, we need to give Black women room to grieve. Ironically, one of, the, one of the ways in which Black women, when they do grieve, is mocked. You, everybody has seen those Black movies where someone dies. Yes. And you go to the funeral. And they will always have a Black woman who's just over the top. And, and what that does is that says that deep, deep emotion expressed by a Black woman is laughable. Deep, deep emotion expressed by a Black woman is something that you make fun of. When in reality, those Black women are really expressing profound grief. So even in our community, it doesn't seem that we have places where our grief and our real deep heartfelt silence is, is felt um, as legitimate. Now, um, I do have a question. I know we're running out of time, um, but I'm wondering in the book, um, do you distinguish between um, black spaces and white spaces when it comes to um, women, in, black women in particular expressing themselves? And oh, yes, I, I have, oh God, yes, I have, a, okay. I have a whole section on working <laughs> at a white university, which is not named and how I had to go angry black woman 101 mm. in a meeting and how justified I felt. And um, I, I dissect the whole reason, you know, a room full of white women who would not stand up when a deeply sexist comment was made, but I stood up and I talk about the, the, the racial politics at a, working at a white university. Wow, okay, this is a deep book. I think we all yeah. need to go out and get this book. This, you, this is a book for black men to read so they understand black women. Yes. Yeah, they yes. might need to get the audio version. Uh, whatever. They might whatever. <laughs> is there an audio version? There's an audio version? Yes, yes. I didn't uh, I right. just assumed that there there was or should be. Yeah, there's so, an audio version. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um well, I, thank you, people, Gwen. People can order it. And oh, one mm. one comment I did. And, and also someone. visit visit my website, mariziagolden.com, and you'll get information about my upcoming writing classes and and other things I'm doing. Okay, and you're a creative writing consultant and a literary consultant. Yes, according to you. Yes, and, 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 you and thank you. Thank you. Well, I I'm doing virtually now. I yeah, you okay. know everything is virtual, so it doesn't matter wherever you are. I can work with you. Perfect, because I'll be calling you. I have some books to write. <laughs> and yeah. Gwen, Gwen, yeah. Gwen, I want to thank you for inviting me tonight. I want to thank you for all the hard work you do supporting Black writers. 
Oh, well, thank you. It is a labor of love. And, you know, I learn a lot. <laughs> so, so um, but, you know, I'm really glad that we have a weekly platform where, so people don't have to wait till the annual event, whatever it may be, whatever, you know, they don't have to wait 12 months or six months or whatever. Every week they get a daily dose. And right. um, we're happy to, to be part of the solution. You know, I, I believe in solving problems, not, not pointing out problems. <laughs> well, so, I'm going to spread the word on my Facebook page and social media about you. Oh, well, thank you. And one thing <laughs> I do want to mention, because we're at the end of our time, but you talk about therapy and it, at least now women can get therapy because that's fairly recent for Black women to be able to. Well, right, right. I mean, this whole, a lot of this conversation is recent. Mm -hmm. You know, in the last 20 years, right. we've had more access. Right. We can talk about things more openly. You know, thanks to Oprah, she brought everything out of the closet. She talked about everything. <laughs> exactly. I, I guess that it did emanate somewhat from that. But, you know, it seems like her conversation centered more around white women. Just That's just my observation. But, well, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you my, my husband's father, when he saw Oprah do a segment on corporal punishment, he apologized to my husband for beating him as a child. So, she, <laughs> <laughs> so Oprah touched everybody. <laughs> well, with that, well, you, I think you know, I saw that episode. <laughs> I didn't, I, I, but, but, you know, Oprah's Oprah. So what, what more can yeah, you say? Yeah. She is, Same. she has made a mark that's going to be permanent yes. in history, present yes. and future. And so, she did make it possible for all of us to bring our stuff out the closet. That's true. She did. Well, thank you so much, Marita, for being a guest on the show. Everybody go out and get this book, The Strong Black Woman. And if you have a black woman in your life, then go easy on her. <laughs> for her. Exactly. Like, if, if, if you have a black her. woman, ask, life, ask her what you can do for her. Right. Ask, ask her, her what, what she can... wants you to do. <laughs> exactly. You're right about well, the way that. it is, is if you have a black woman in your life, give her some grace. If you are yeah. a black woman, give yourself some grace. Exactly. Yeah. But exactly. you're right. Ask her, because that's what I tell my husband. Ask me what I want. Then you'll know for real. Because I'm going to tell exactly. you exactly what don't assume. <laughs> And that way we'll both be happy. So anyway. Exactly. <laughs> so thank you so much again, Marita. And thank you. I um, enjoyed it. All right. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Well. Thank you. Much needed topic. Take care. Thank you. You're Bye -bye. welcome. Bye-bye.